when I was preparing for this lecture, I realized that it's very likely I would have something in common with you, with the audience. Because if you think about it, you're here at the meeting of the Belgian Physical Society. Right at this moment, there are sessions going on about spectacular research in any domain of physics. And you are not there. You are here in a session on physics and education. So that means that you care about improving education. And so do I. That is something we have in common. And if I can translate my experience to you, your situation, and I can guess you probably get very often this type of question from skeptical people. Why do we need to improve science education at all? We see that science is progressing, so that means we have good scientists, so they probably are well educated. So what's wrong? Well, I don't need to convince you that there are some issues with that question. You are already the converted people. But let me tell me let me tell you what is the kind of answer I would give when I get that question. So let me first zoom in on the background of that question. What do people really tell if they raise that objection? They often tell something like this. Lecturing, that's a very natural way of conveying information. You know something, you group some people around you, and you tell them what you know. That's what the ancient Greek did already. That is what happened in the Middle Ages. People lectured like this in the 19th century universities. We still do it today. It works. It has emerged through history as a system that is working well. Now, I would compare that to the following situation. I'm confronted with a problem. I have a piece of wood and I have a nail. I want to get that nail into the wood. How do I do that? I have some tool here. And you will not be surprised that I use that tool to solve my problem. I have another problem. I have a nut and I want to eat it. How do I crack that nut? I have my tool. Let's try to crack the nut. Oops, that makes some dirt, not very efficient. I maybe used it a bit too hard. My nut is cracked a bit, but well, I solved the problem. Another problem, I want to drink this bottle. How do I open it? Still have my tool. I will not really try that, but you can imagine that if I do this carefully enough, I will be able to open the bottle. That's an illustration of a well-known saying. If you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Translated to our situation, if your only way of conveying information, conveying knowledge, is lecturing, then you address every teaching situation by a lecture which is not necessarily always the best way. Sometimes it was the best way. If you think back about the ancient Greek and the Middle Ages, what was the, where did you find the information that you want to convey? It's in books. Not the books as we know them today, <coughs> but books like these ones, handwritten texts, which are very rare, and you find them only in a few specific places. So what does the teacher do in the Middle Ages? The professor goes to the university library in the morning, takes there the one single copy of the physics of Aristotle, brings it to the lecture room, opens it, and starts reading the book to the students, because the knowledge is there in that book, and you have to get it out to your audience. At that time in history, that was the thing you had to do. But since that time, we learned how to print books, so they are many copies available. 
that were things like radio, television, computers, the internet. Much more tools that can modify our way of teaching. And still, very often, we are using that old lecturing system. Like the nail and the hammer. If there are different teaching needs, maybe we should use also different teaching methods. Nowadays, with the technology that we have, we can do that. I told you that you are convinced that there can be improvements made to science teaching. And many people know that there are problems. Even our students know it. If you start paying attention to that, you will notice that your students have a problem with lecture. I realized that very clearly a few years ago when I got a mail from a student that went like this. So, dear professor, due to an appointment that was fixed already a long time ago, I will not be able to attend the first lecture of your course that will start next week. Do I miss something important if I skip that first lecture? I was really depressed by that mail. <laughs> because I tried to imagine what would that student do if he or she would go to the movies and they say, well, this evening we have cut away the first 15 minutes of the movie, but nobody will have a problem about that, do you? Or they want to buy a, a novel and they say, well, problem in the printing shop, the first chapter is not there, but we still charge them the same price. Of course, they will object. For a course, for lectures, they do not object. That's because deep inside they know that nothing useful is happening there. They really don't miss anything. So they all know there is a problem, and many of us know there is a problem, but still lots of our colleagues are behaving in the old way. That's a complicated situation. So what is really wrong with the lectures as we know them. Two aspects, I think. Well, you can say many things about this, but I could condense them in two different aspects. It was already mentioned in the previous lecture, there is a problem with activation. That's something that psychology research has shown over and over again. You cannot learn something if you are not mentally active during the learning process. And Listening, even with interest, to a story that is being told, that is not a sufficient level of being mentally active. So you don't learn by doing that. It's easy to prove. You will forget 90% of everything that I'm telling you here. And you can verify that, because this lecture is being recorded. In a few days you will find it on YouTube. If you then listen again, you will say many times, ah, that's right, he said that too. I had forgotten about it. So, lecturing has a problem with activation. There is also a different aspect, a different problem, and that I can illustrate by this anecdote. So one of my children is currently learning to type, blind typing with ten fingers, he's nine years old. And they do that on this type of old laptops. Now, you can imagine when he started that course at the dinner table, he started talking about the old days when we were learning to type. Not on old laptops, but on such typewriters. And our children, they have never seen such a device. It's completely unknown for them. So we try to describe what we have to do. We have to insert that paper, turn the roll, you press on these buttons quite hard. There are hammers smashing on the rhythm with ink, and in that way you type a letter. They were very interested in listening to that story, and it looked like they had understood how hard our life was in that time. And then a few minutes later, that guy said, but there is one thing I don't understand about the typewriter. Once you have done that, how do, you, how do you then get that letter printed? 
<laughs> and then I realized, obviously, he didn't understand anything about what I was telling him. Just as students in a lecture very often do not really understand what you are trying to tell them. And as long as they don't ask you a question, you will never know that they have a problem. You will only discover that at the exam, and then it's too late. So that's a very weak point of the lecturing system. There is a problem of feedback. You don't know really what your students are thinking. Now, many of the teaching innovation methods of the past 20 years, they have focused in the first place on this activation aspect. That was mentioned in the previous lecture. How can we make the lectures better? Some of these you now classical methods like peer instruction, like using clickers, these are tools to get students active during the lecture session. They do not focus that much on feedback, well, to, some, to some extent, but activation is the, the bigger issue there. I got convinced during the past few years that if we really want to improve teaching, that we have to address both. And you cannot do that by just improving the lecture. You need something very different. And what we heard in the previous lecture here this change of an entire curriculum with a different way of organizing your semester, that is something that works on that aspect very much. Now, that is happening at the management level of the university. I am not involved with the management level, I am involved with my classes. So I was searching for ways how I could implement a very different system that is hopefully more efficient in my own lectures. And that's how I came to this flipped classroom topic that I want to talk about here today. So we need change, and in my case, for, from the teacher point of view, one possible way to change was converting my courses into flipped classroom format. What do I mean by flipped classroom? Well, I will explain it to you in exactly the same way as I explain it to the students in the first contact mode. I tell them, often you will have got this message from your teachers, okay, what do we expect from you? Well, you come to our lectures, then at home in the evening you digest the content, maybe you have some questions, and these you ask in the next class session, and so on and so on. Then you come to the examination period, where you have some time to recapitulate all the information, that prepares you for taking the exam. Just a quick poll. How many of you used that on a regular basis as their study system when you were still students? Almost more than one half of the room. That's a lot. I have a little suspicion that some of you are being too optimistic about what you did. Because a realistic student Hardly ever does it that way. The real situation for students <laughs> is this. <laughs> they come to the lecture, they don't study it in the evening, so they cannot ask questions, so they lose the moment where they are mentally active, and we lose the feedback, because if they don't ask questions, we don't know what they are thinking, and after a few weeks in the semester, they are totally lost, they don't know what you are talking about, and that's how you get these groups of passive students that many of us are familiar with. But that's not a problem, because then you have the study period before the exam, and then you can recover everything with superficial learning, and you can still pass the exam. What does the classroom do? We try to use the same time investments as in this ideal world, but in a way that students really do it. And that happens by flipping the red and the green dot. <coughs> so we ask students to do their study work before coming to class, and in the class session there is not the lecturing, 
not the one-way trans uh, transport of information. No, there's only focus on addressing the questions the students might have, the problems they encountered during the study. Then you need a way, of course, to give them this information first. And that is something they could not easily do in the Middle Ages, but something we can do nowadays with the technology we have. So I will zoom in on the many different ways in which you can give students the information, but think for a while about movies. So you give students information through movies, you associate questions to that, questions and tasks. And that's a very important aspect of this method. It's not the most visible and not the most spectacular aspect, but the most important one. To every of these preparation sessions, there should be relevant questions and tasks associated. Tasks about which they have to write some kind of report. And that report is then given to the teacher 24 hours before the class session starts. So the teacher has the time to read through this report and get an enormous amount of feedback on what the students are really thinking, and then responds in class by focusing on the problems that have emerged there. If there is a topic where clearly the students have no problem about, then don't come back to that topic in class. If there is a, a, a topic where there is a problem, well, focus on it. Just to illustrate how that would happen, what, what is an activity that can happen in such a class session? Well, often you will have, to a specific question, two groups of answers, two conflicting ideas. Maybe one of them is right and the other is wrong, or both are wrong. Well, you could make one slide with the two answers, put it on the screen and tell them one of these answers is right, the other is wrong. I disappeared from the room for 10 minutes. It's up to you to find out which of the two answers is right. When I come back, you tell me. And then nice peer discussions happen. And when you come back, very often you find out they have identified the right answer. And everybody is already convinced now why that answer is correct. And you move on to the next story. A very different way of teaching. It looks almost as if the lecturer is not needed anymore, because the lecturer doesn't lecture. But the lecturer is still the important person who gets that whole system working. I will mingle in some tips and tricks in this presentation. And the first tip is, it's very important that you avoid covering material again that was already in that preparation session. If you do that without a reason, just because you want to be sure that they really understood it, so maybe they didn't understood it really well from that video, I will tell it again in class. If you do that, be sure that after two, three weeks, nobody will make that preparation any longer. Why should they do? They just come to class and they hear the same story again. So be strict on that for yourself. People wonder, when you tell them this method, but will students really do this preparation work? And if I want to trigger them to do that by giving some credits for that preparation work, am I not going against the safe learning environment? We are still in the learning phase. It's possible. It should be possible for them to make mistakes. But if I give credits for a bad or a wrong answer, so this is pedagogically not good. So how do we solve that issue? The system, I, well, there are two, two remedies to this. First of all, in my experience, there is not much of a problem. Students rather spontaneously do this preparation work because there is the peer pressure. If they come to class and they see that some of their colleagues who did the preparation can go on with the interaction, can give replies, and they cannot. Well, you feel isolated in the group, so next time you try to prepare. 
So that's one strong motivation. And to facilitate that even more, there is the trick with the four points. I tell them at the beginning of the semester, for the 20 points for this course, you get already now four for free. They are yours. Provided, yeah, whatever the, whatever the answer is, you got four points. I will come to that, yeah. So they, they get four points even before the first task is submitted. They, get, they start with four points. And any time they do not submit a task, or when they submit a task, a report that is obviously uh, well, taken over from a colleague, or just with two words, that, that it's obvious that they didn't do any effort, if such a thing happens, they lose one of these points. But as long as they submit a fair report that shows they, that they have done effort, whether the answers are right or wrong, that doesn't matter. If they submit a report, they keep their four points. The advantage of doing it that way is that you do not run into the end of semester situation. Some people say, well, if they have submitted 80% of the reports, then they get their four points. But if you do that, then after 80% of the semester, people who have submitted everything feel now we can relax. We don't need to submit the last two reports of the semester any longer. With this system, the incentive is there until the very end of the course. So with these two aspects, the natural social pressure, helped by these four points they have to safeguard, I have no problems at all with reports that are not submitted. So I'm teaching to rather small groups, five to ten students, but it's very normal that I have ten out of my ten reports every week. So just this week a course was ending with eight students. There has not been a single week when a student has not submitted a report. It works very well. Well, how does that pre-class material, the material in which the content of the course is fed to the students, how does that look like? I will distinguish three different ways of giving that information. And there will be different situations in which these ways can be helpful. The first one is through movies. And that's a funny aspect. We, I'm sure if you are occupying yourself with teaching innovations, you will have heard these bad reports about the, about the bad effects of PowerPoint lectures. PowerPoint kills attention, kills interaction, kills activation. Nevertheless, a lot of us have sets of slides for your typical courses. And once you have that set of, set of, of good slides, you have an important piece of material to go to the video format. You can, just as I'm doing now, give the lecture and record your voice and the screen on which you project your slides which is also being recorded here. And that is, in a natural way, you have a piece of video about that section of your lecture, which you then can give to the students of the next year as, um, as their pre-class material. It could well be that the thing I'm recording here can be used for the teacher's education program of next year. That's, once you start doing that, you will soon find out that it's never a good idea not to record whatever you tell. You can use it or you cannot use it afterwards, that's up to you. But if you make the recording, well, then at least you have the possibility to use it. How is that done? Well, you need some microphone, and I'm very happy with this very large but good quality device that's captures only the sound that is within 10 centimeters from my mouth. And then some post-processing software, Camtasia is very often used in educational environments, where you can cut out bad sections, intermix some, some animations. And, well, very low threshold material that works very well. I think at this stage, I will show one minute of one of these videos. The same you can do for the excited state, for the end state of the transition. 
So the nuclear spin remains seven halves. The atomic total angular momentum is also seven halves, as we can read here. So also here we have a splitting into eight different levels. And now we can examine all transitions between, say, for instance, this level here with f equals 7 at the bottom and f equals 7 at the top. This corresponds to the notation 7, 7 that is given here with this particular peak. So the peak you see here encircled in red is the peak that corresponds to the transition given by this red arrow. The one encircled in green has as label 4, 5. So that will be a transition from the lower level with f equals 4 to an upper level with f equals 5, and so on. So the hyperfine splitting of the lower and upper fine structure level, that is the reason why you see many peaks in this experimental spectrum. So that video which you just saw was taken either at home without an audience or taken the year, taken the year before in a class with an audience. And whenever I was pointing to the blackboards in the lecture, I afterwards inserted some arrow or circle to guide the eye of the person who watches the video. Tip. If you work with videos in that way, it's very useful if you keep them short. So the rule of thumb is not longer than six to nine minutes. Test that for yourself if you browse YouTube. How often does it happen that you watch for more than five minutes to one YouTube movie? Very rare. The content should be very, very interesting before you watch more than five minutes. That's the natural attention span of people. And the extra advantage by using these short movies is it's much easier to change. Imagine that the next year you think, well, of all the material I have prepared, everything is useful except for that particular aspect there. I want to, to change these few slides. If that is a part of a one hour lecture, you will have to repeat that full one hour lecture. If that is part of a um, five minute video, you only have to repeat these five minutes. So you are much more flexible in making changes later on. You build some patchwork of small pieces of information that you can order according to the needs of your future courses. Another implication is that if you do it that way, it would probably not be wise to do, to do that for a course that you are teaching for the very first time. Because you are then still in the process of building up your course material. And once you start recording, well, you don't want to repeat that every year. You want to make changes year by year, but want, do not want to go through the entire process every year. So you should have a good starting point of course material. A course which you have taught for two or three years and then you start clipping it, that's probably the way to go. And don't be afraid to spend a little bit of money, just a little bit. Such a good microphone that's 100 euro, this Camtasia software or other screencast software is sort of magnitude 250 euro. It's a one-time investment and you will benefit from years worth. There, are, there is a lot of free screencast software on the internet, but you will, uh, I tried several of them before landing with Camtasia and they all have issues, they are not stable or they do not exactly what you want. Better spend a little bit of money and use immediately a better professional tool. More practical, once you have this set of videos, how do you offer them to the students? Where do you put them? For many of us in higher education, that will probably not be a big issue because all universities have their own digital learning platform. So you can easily put these videos there and then the students can watch them on their device wherever they are. If you are in a secondary school where such an environment is not available, then there are other possibilities. You could think about of simply putting them on YouTube or on Vimeo, even without any learning environment. 
that works as well. Or you have a hybrid way, even with the digital learning environments at the universities. Often you can make links to YouTube or video, that the videos are physically on YouTube, but they appear embedded in the live learning environment. So that makes it more flexible if you go to a different place, if you teach the same course at two universities. You can use the same set of videos, but just integrate it into different learning environments. Or you can go to a totally independent solution, which is a very nice one, the ED Puzzle. It's an open source project that is meant to insert question interaction in existing video material. So you have a video on YouTube, you open a session in ED Puzzle, and you insert questions into that. I have a screenshot here. So this is, um, I don't know which science video that somebody puts on YouTube. Well, you integrate that video inside ED Puzzle, and at the moments you want, you insert questions which you define yourself. The student plays the video inside ED Puzzle. Once the a question is reached, the video stops, the question appears, the student can answer the question. The answers go to the teacher, you can easily collect them. And so without any investment, independent of your institution, you have here an open source video platform to in interact with your students. Here I need to insert a wake-up call because I'm talking now about videos for several minutes and this is indeed often the more visible aspect of a flipped classroom setup. But don't forget, and you will repeat it several times, what really matters is the quality of the questions. Just recording your lectures, giving them to the students and that's it, that will not work. You need good questions, right level, at the right place in the video, about the right type of content to find out where their problems are and to remediate their misconceptions. Ah, another objection. This I found out only recently. So I have been telling this story several times by now, and sometimes people are enthusiastic, sometimes they are not. And the ones who are not enthusiastic, they often have this concern. I'm a teacher and a researcher. I'm not a video developer. Do you really expect from all of us teachers and researchers that we now become video developers? We are not educated for that. And we probably even don't have the time to do that. Well, does Flip Classroom stand or falls with the availability of with the capability of making videos? Not necessarily. There are alternative ways. And I've experimented a bit with them in the past semester. The second, and well, at first sight maybe surprising way, is going back to text material. In many courses, especially courses in the first bachelor years, you have very good textbooks. Or you have teachers who wrote their own notes and they are well tested and really nice. So can we use them again? There are ways to do that in a flip classroom format. As long as you can convert these text materials into a PDF, then you can export them to a social annotation platform. Think about Google Doc or about a dedicated teaching platform as Notabene. I will elaborate a little bit on Notabene, which is an open source project from MIT. And again, you have a screenshot here. How does that work? Well, in this particular class session, in this particular week of the semester, I gave the students, instead of video material, a few papers, research papers, that were dealing with the topic of that week. And they didn't get, get the PDF of these papers as such. They got it through that Notabene platform. If they open the PDF there, they have the possibility to indicate a section in the text and write a question there. In this case, the student, one of the students was asking or was, was wondering, well, I see there a hyperfine field of more than 30 Tesla, isn't that terribly large? 
The other students, they see the questions of their colleagues and they can answer on them. So one of the students answered, indeed, I, I realize I have that problem as well, but I googled for some typical values and indeed that doesn't seem to be very, that, that, that seems to be a very normal value. And then the third student replies, well, but didn't you notice this particular video of three weeks ago? We met there that same example, even for the same material, and it was indeed this 33 Tesla. So they are educating themselves by reading through this material. And then the class session, you can focus on those discussions that turned out to be not completely answered yet. You also immediately see where the problems are. If there are sections where there are a lot of questions or remarks, then these are the sections you have to focus on during class. If something goes without problem, just leave it. So this way of offering your pre-class review, not as a video, but as a text in a social annotation platform, that would be a very natural way to use flip classroom in a course where you have already good text material. And then I think in particular about courses in the first few years of the education. And the third way is maybe not for courses in the very first years, but rather for courses in the final years. That is just using the internet as your textbook because you want to prepare the students to the situation which is the real life situation where there are no textbooks any longer for their future problems. You will have to go out and find the information you need on the internet. But there is so much information there. So when you are still learning, you can get lost. So let's use the concept of the teacher as a coach and you tell them, well, the task of this week is I have here a list of a few websites, a few research papers, a few videos, and watch this and this and this, answer these and these and these questions about this, and send me a report. So no textbook any longer, no need to make videos, just the teacher who selects the right way through the internet to come to the relevant information for the topic of this week. Is in terms of Preparation work for the teacher much easier than preparing the videos and is a natural transition for the students to go from lecture-based learning or textbook-based learning to finding information yourself on the web. <coughs> that is how you can practically implement this method. What are the effects? Well, I told you I'm teaching to small groups, so I have no big statistical analysis. Most of my information is qualitative information from formal and informal uh, questioning of the students. So don't take my claims here as something that is statistically relevant, although I do believe that my claims for my students are correct. First about learning gain. Well, this picture illustrates what I experienced. One of these courses I have been teaching for 15 years, so I know very well what to expect from students. And since the two years that I use for the classroom with that course, the level of the students, of the exam, the exam level of the students has risen dramatically. It is now really possible to discuss <coughs> with these students on a much higher level than was possible in, in any of the preceding years. <coughs> I feel the difference enormously well. I can't quantify that, but the uh, effect is so large that I have no doubt that this is true. The effect was so large that I even went back to the literature to search did other people ever measure similar effects, and you find quite a lot of information of recent class, flipped classroom experiments and the learning effects of these. And I just quote one of them, um, American University that in collaboration with edX, which is a MOOC platform, organized a course that had classroom sessions in connection with flipped classroom sessions. So a mixture of the two methods. 
and they could compare that with the same course that was taught several years before. And the number of students who passed that course increased a lot. So my subjective inter the feeling goes along with what people really measured in larger groups. So the learning gain can be very high in this method. How do students react to this in terms of study behavior? How did the method change their study behavior? These are some of the reactions I got from students. If I ask them, how often do you work for this, for this course, which is a six credit course with one class session per week, well, they say it's about four or five hours per week, every week of the semester. That was never true without a flipped classroom. Then they would maybe work the same total amount, but during the study period after the semester. They acknowledge that it is less, that they have to study less in the weeks before the exam. I even explicitly triggered that because I put my exam for this course on the very first day of the examination period. So in order to reduce the possible study time as much as possible. And students had no problem about this. They felt they were prepared. Something I was totally not prepared for. Several students indicated that they watched every video at least twice and sometimes three times. And I can see that from the analytics that is behind the video side, that this indeed that it is indeed true. I would never have dreamed that this was possible. Can you imagine that if you are teaching and you ask a student, you have attended this lecture, fine, come back tomorrow and attend the same lecture again. They will say you're crazy. But if you give them the possibility to do that secretly at home, they really do that. So no wonder that the results are much better. They have seen the material, they are exposed to the material much more often than in the traditional system. And that was not something I asked, that happened spontaneously. Another clear thing is they indicate that they do not watch these videos linearly. They watch until they meet a problem. Not a, a question I ask, but a problem in their own understanding. They stop the video and they start Googling for the answer. So it's a very dynamic study way for themselves as well. They are not passive watchers, they actively go searching for the information they need. Not in post, it's spontaneously held. Something that went wrong during the first year, well, didn't went wrong, but students discovered that once you had gone through all these videos and you didn't take notes during watching, then you were in trouble because what do I do when I want to study? Do I now really have to rewatch everything again? In a textbook, you don't do that. You, you have your notes and you scan through the text or through the notes and you quickly find the information you need. In a video, you cannot that easily search. So this is now the recommendation I give from the very start. If you watch these videos, make careful notes as if you were in a lecture room. That will be an important instrument in the study process. That was the study behavior of the students. How do they appreciate this method? Also there, I gathered some information. One of the students in an anonymous survey answered that, well, I'm now a student since five years, and there has never been a course where I was so well prepared for the exam, which was a strong indication for me that the system indeed had the intended effect. It's a lot of work, but you benefit from it, was another remark. Somebody was reflecting, well, if I watch these videos at home, sometimes my thoughts wander, wander away. I lose my concentration. That might look like a problem, but that same student adds, actually the same happens if you are in a lecture room, and then there is no rewind button to catch up with the few minutes you have missed. Some people were wondering what would happen if all courses would use that system. That's an interesting point. Would there be enough time to digest everything, to make all the preparations? There are two things I want to say to that. 
This system does not require more time from the students than the traditional system. If there would be a time problem with this system, then it means that in the traditional system, the students do not work as much as we expect them to work. So there should not be a problem. Nevertheless, if there would be a problem, if maybe in the traditional system we would ask too much from the students, well, then a natural solution could be have less class sessions. And that agrees very well with the OASA lecture we just heard. It's simply not right to ask students to be during six or eight hours a day in a class and then still digest that information later on. For my six credits, one class session per week is more than enough, but they work three, four times more than that in the time they, they make for that for themselves. So we should go away from this class-based lecturing system. That is really not working, at least not if we want the students to digest everything properly. What are the effects on the time of the teaching? Is this easier to teach? Does it require less time from you than in a traditional uh, system where you have maybe three of these lectures a week instead of one of them? Well, I have to disappoint you. It doesn't save you time. Because don't underestimate preparing a good class session about the reports you received 24 hours before, that, um, that is an effort. And it's not an effort you can do once and then benefit from it the next years, because next year you will have a different set of answers. And you really have to show the students, I'm not telling a prepared story here, I really look at your answers and I'm addressing your problems. So you have to do that every year again. That's takes as much time as in the traditional teaching. The good aspect is that the learning effect is better, so you have spent your time better. Something I discovered this year, and well, it happened to be that my one class session for one course this year was on Monday on, at 10 o'clock in the morning. I ask the students to submit their reports 24 hours in advance, so that means that I can prepare that session only on Sunday. So if you can avoid having flip classroom sessions on Mondays, and especially on Monday mornings, it's wise to avoid that. For next year, I will try to have that changed. But we have to run into it until we realize that there is a problem. To finish, a few more tips and tricks. If you would change an existing course into a flipped classroom system at once, that's an enormous amount of work. I tried it once and no, never again. But it's quite possible to change it step by step. You can take one topic, convert that topic, and you have in your regular course one week where you have a flipped classroom session. And then the next year you add two or three weeks and after a few years your entire course is converted. And I expect that your students will ask you, once they have had all of the course into the classroom session, they will ask you, why is that other half still in the old way? They, in my feeling, I see they like it, so they ask themselves for it. In my first attempts, I recorded videos at home using my normal course slides. I'm changing now more and more to a somewhat more time efficient system. I rearrange my slides in a way that I fit this six to nine video minutes chunks and then use these slides for a last time in a normal class lecture and record it on the spot. It's much more dynamical than if you do it at home. At home you have Oh, I said the wrong word there. Let's repeat that sentence. And before you know it, you spend 10 times longer than the duration of the video just to record it. If you do it in a classroom session, well, you just go on. And if there's something really, really bad, you can still cut it away. But if you don't, no, everything is natural. It's important to inform the students about your 
well, this fits this way of teaching. So tell them what you think it will trigger in them. Tell them what you expect them in terms of submitting tasks and making notes. Because if it's not clear what is expected, they will not easily do it. And once you miss the start of such a, of such a course, it's hard to catch up. Once again, the tasks are very important. The system will not work if you do not have good tasks. Fortunately, finding good tasks is the easiest thing to adapt in the next year. You can keep your videos, but maybe find better tasks for that video. So that's, the mo that's the least work-intensive part. It's much more important to invest time in finding good tasks than investing time in making professional-looking videos. And as a kind of final message, you can have many objections and fears and hesitations about the methods. And I heard people saying, well, it looks good, but I don't think I'm confident enough to try it. My advice would be, jump. Because even if you use that method not in the most optimal way, the method itself is already so powerful that you and your students will benefit from it. Even if you make beginner's mistakes. I have made beginner's mistakes, and a lot of them, Nevertheless, there was a positive effect in the learning gain of the students. I will ask to enter the little question round so to inspect is this something that you could use? And I will ask you a few questions. For all of you, whether you are teaching or assisting in courses or whatever, try to imagine yourself in the role of a teacher and Imagine what you would answer to this statement. Every year, when I teach my course, I tell more or less the same story. Would you answer yes to that or no? If you answer yes, then please raise your hand. More or less. More or less, yeah. So let's say if 80% of your course is the same, then the answer is yes. If you answer yes, raise your hand and keep it raised. Then consider the second question. I feel that my students are not very responsive. Is your answer yes to that? Keep it, you keep your hand raised. If it is not, louder the hand. So the people who have now their hands up still, these are the ones where they are in a situation where a flipped classroom approach would be very beneficial. If your students are already responsive, that might indicate that you succeed in another way to have an interactive dynamic lecture. So if you're good at that, why not? And if perhaps your course is changing content every year because it is something that is related to, to the news, for instance, well, then it's harder to have these three class tasks. So then maybe the classroom is not the right form for that course. A similar question, yes or no? I have the feeling that for some of my students, my course goes too fast, and for others, it goes too slow. Who answers yes to that? Half of the room? That could be another reason to go to flip classroom, because now it's easier for the students to adapt their speeds to their own level of understanding. They can do it a little bit slower in the beginning and then speed up. Or if it's very easy for them, well, they spend maybe two hours while the others spend four hours. So it's much more addressing the needs of the individual student. Okay, that was my story. I can give only, I can formulate only one hope. I have found a lot of joy in making this transition to flipped classroom teaching. It is a very different way of teaching. It asks different skills and attitudes, but I would never want to go back. And if I can stimulate some of you to explore in the same direction, I will be very happy. This presentation you will find in a few days on this YouTube channel. There is already a well, slightly older Dutch version of that presentation available there. 
so that this English one will follow soon. And now I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.